could the universe have existed forever? Well, Dr. Craig uses two philosophical arguments and one scientific argument for a negative answer to this question. Now, the philosophical arguments say that the universe could not have existed forever because the mathematical notion of an actual infinite, like say uh, a library with infinitely num uh, many books, yield self-contradictory results. You get absurdities and, and contradictions. So you check out all of the uh, odd-numbered books from an infinite library, and an infinite number remain. But you check out all the books numbered four and higher, and only four remain. Yet, paradoxically, in both cases, you remo removed the same number of books from the library, right? An infinite number of books. Well. If we try to describe the situation using arithmetic, we, we can't do it. Um, infinity minus infinity in one case gives you four, and in another case it gives you infinity. Well, I'm not sure I see the contradiction here. I mean, infinity minus infinity is undefined in mathematical terms, technically, um, but that can't stop you from checking books out of a library. Um, why? Well, because books are not numbers, and removing them is not the same thing as subtraction. Um, as the philosopher Wes Morriston observes, quote, if a person, quote, checks out one or more books, he does indeed remove them from the library, but he's not subtracting them in the mathematical sense. If you remove the set, one, three, five, and so on, the remaining set is zero, two, four, etc., up to infinity. Whereas if you remove the set four, five, six, the even numbered set, the remaining set is only zero, one, two, and three. Well, this fact about the library is remarkable. It's strange even, but I don't see the logical contradiction. Um, Morriston, again, addition and subtraction of numbers is one thing. Constructing a new set by adding new members or removing old ones is a quite different thing. Operations of the second sort may be possible even when operations of the first sort make no sense or are undefined. Now there is an intuition here and the example of Hilbert's ho hotel taps into this intuition. The intuition is that a section of the hotel or the library must be in some way lesser than the totality. Uh, the thought that the section and the totality have the same number of elements seems to violate this intuition, right? But there might be another way to make sense of the intuition. I mean, we can say that the set of all odd-numbered books is clearly lesser than, in a real sense, lesser than the entire library. It's lesser in the sense that it's a proper subset of all the books. The library as a whole contains the set of odd-numbered books, and in this way, the whole can be seen as greater than one of its parts, despite the fact that they both have the same number of elements. So I think we can satisfy the intuitions that uh, Craig's example of Hilbert's Hotel are tugging on um, without having to collapse mathematical operations like subtraction into real physical operations. After all, we're talking about the physical universe here, not math. It would be strange, actually, if a philosopher's intuitions uh, rather than physicists' research would tell us whether the universe is infinitely old. I mean, if the recent history of science has taught us anything, it's that our theoretical and intuitive grasp of the world, um, especially us philosophers, is often worlds away from our uh, intuitive beliefs. As one journalist put it, science now tells us that atoms are 99.9% .9 space, but we still have real trouble walking through walls. What about the scientific argument? Can I have the slide on how did the universe begin, please? I'm a bit puzzled by Dr. Craig's use of the Big Bang as empirical confirmation of the claim that the universe began to exist um, from nothing. That's not how many mainstream physicists would characterize it. Brian Greene, professor of physics and mathematics at Columbia University, writes in his latest book, The Fabric of the Cosmos, a common misconception is that the Big Bang provides a theory of cosmic origins. It doesn't. The Big Bang is a theory that delimitates cosmic evolution from a split second after whatever happened to bring the universe into existence. But it says nothing at all about time zero itself. And since, according to the Big Bang theory, 
The bang is what is supposed to have happened at the beginning. The big bang leaves out the bang. It tells us nothing about what banged, why it banged, how it banged. Now, as physicists trace the expansion of the universe backwards in time, they reach a point at which their current theory just breaks down. Uh, many cosmologists think that a full account will await a new insight that synthesizes uh, Einstein's relativity theory with quantum mechanics. That's the science which deals with very, very small systems. There are lots of contenders for such a uh, unified theory, but no clear victors as of yet. In 2002, the National Research Council reported on 11 unanswered questions in physics and astronomy, and one of them is, how did the universe begin? So I think it's fair to conclude that our scientific knowledge of the origins of the universe is just nowhere near complete, and therefore it would be premature at best to use it as a premise in an ambitious theological argument such as, such as Craig's. Now, in any case, the postulation of a transcendent cause of the cosmos would be of no help. This is because it presupposes a radically new and mysterious kind of causation, totally unknown to science. The causes that we know about, they precede their effects in time. By contrast, God's creative action, as described by Dr. Craig, does not precede its effect in time, since God transcends time, right? Craig asks, how could a timeless cause give rise to a temporal effect? He answers that the timeless cause must be a person. Well, what could that mean? Persons as we know them do things in time. Furthermore, causation as we know it involves the rearrangement of some pre-existing material as when you, say, build a sandcastle uh, out of pre-existing sand. Well, God's action is supposed to produce its effect out of nothing at all. Well, what could that mean? If Craig wants, to make, uh, wants theism to make sense of the origins of the universe, he owes us at least a rough sketch of how such causation is supposed to work.